Welcome to this installment of EJ Live. And in issue 29.3, we will be publishing a symposium entitled The Crime of Aggression Before the International Criminal Court, which is convened by Dapo Akande and Antonio Tsanakopoulos. And we have selected to feature in this installment of EJ Live one of the articles in that symposium entitled International Criminal Justice as a Peace Project, written by Professor Frederick Maigret from the University of McGill. Welcome to EJ Live. Thank it's you. It's not your first time, I think. Always happy to be back. And uh, I want to start with uh, a rather explosive statement that, uh, or proposition, that you make in the article. And uh, to get it right, I'm going to read from the abstract. It might be that compared to classical, the, a classical approach in which the International Criminal Justice Project was seen as a crucial part of the collective security regime, international criminal justice is now one of the factors that potentially undermines traditional prohibitions on the use of force. I think uh, to our readers, that already whets your appetite, and maybe try and explain what you have in mind. So there's a bit of a build-up to, to reach that uh, conclusion, and, and I, I realize uh, it may seem counterintuitive. I think that, that on, on the long run, uh, you know, I think most scholars tend to think of international criminal justice as, as globally oriented towards a maximization of, of peace uh, in international relations. And certainly, uh, that the, the association between uh, the maintaining and enforcing international peace and security and international criminal justice was very strong in the 1920s and 1930s up to uh, Nuremberg and uh, Tokyo. I, I mean, what I try to argue in the article is that you know, the movement over time, especially if you adopt a, a long-term perspective, tends to undermine some of its original tenets and so the assumptions. So original, the original assumption was, or your, the original proposition is that in that era, it was the prospect of standing trial for a war of aggression, etc., which will have a chilling effect on the willingness to go to war. Absolutely. Uh, uh, whether it's deterrent in the sort of conventional criminal law sense or uh, whether early so-called international criminal lawyers envisage that you know, a, a criminal chamber of the Permanent Court of International Justice would uh, uh, judge states who had uh, waged war, the obsession is really averting war. And, and, and uh, some the repression of, of, of minor uh, crimes is attached to that, but they're always sort of cross-border incidents that might uh, lead uh, to a resumption of hostilities. And of course, this is very much embedded in, uh, uh, as an offshoot of the, uh, of the Versailles uh, project and the League of Nations, a fairly minor one, right? I mean, lawyers in the 1920s and 1930s obsessing about all kinds of other issues and, and there's high hopes, uh, at least for a while, in, in the League itself and, and, and its council. But you can see that as a, as a kind of discrete insurance policy, uh, international criminal lawyers operating at the intersection between criminal law and public international law uh, especially coming from small Balkanic nations, quite interestingly. Uh, 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 Romanian, uh, Polish, uh, um, uh, Greek lawyers uh, really sort of start investing in this idea that uh, uh, we should be able to prosecute those who initiate wars of uh, aggression. And perhaps wisely, they don't totally trust uh, the existing system at the time. Now, obviously, uh, in doing so, they inscribe international criminal justice in a temps long of uh, projects for perpetu perpetual peace, right? Uh, the right sort of great ABCS or Emmanuel Kant uh, uh, tradition of peace through law. Uh, and you, you, in, in a sense, Nuremberg and Tokyo are the combination of that instinct, right? That, that really there is no worse ill than uh, a state attacking another state. And this is very clear in uh, the Nuremberg-in uh, construction of crimes against peace as you know, famously the mother of all crimes. Right? It is really, as far as the international community is concerned, uh, uh, when a state attacks a, a, another state, that 
all these other negative uh, and, and horrendous consequences flow. Now, in part, that's not a judgment that we really stand by anymore, right? And, and uh, there's uh, rightly so a lot of revisionist uh, uh, readings of, of Nuremberg that, that have questioned the focus on crimes against peace. Uh, and, and, you know, our, I think contemporary sensitivity is to see the, the Holocaust as, you know, s significantly graver than the uh, invasion of Czechoslovakia, grave as it uh, uh, may have been. So that's the high point, right? And, and I think, uh, I, I, I think the, the last decade, particularly the last two decades, have uh, proceeded on quite different assumptions, but as often these need to be teased out. And as you know, there's a kind of ecumenical discourse. On the surface, everyone agrees that, of course, we want peace, we want humanitarianism, we want to punish human rights violations, etc. But certain priorities emerge over time. Uh, and ag repressing aggression is clearly not one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, the first sign of that's the case is the creation of the ad hoc uh, international criminal tribunals, which are very focused on, on um, internal armed conflicts, uh, uh, a genocide in the case of Rwanda, uh, seen as not particularly, and, and probably rightly in those cases, entailing a, a sort of interstate uh, uh, dimension. Um, but, but something's going on in, in, in the background, and I think that is more fundamentally the reframing of international peace and security. And, you know, people mention this, and people know that the Security Council has opened up what international peace and security means to include domestic violence and, 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 and you know, weak states and humanitarian violations and refugee flows, etc. But I think it may be that we haven't fully drawn the lessons of that evolution as it proceeds at the level of the so, Security Council. So to make a, translate this into an extreme proposition, are you trying to say that they're saying well, war is a bad thing, but as long as they don't commit war crimes when you commit it, then we can live with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, they, they, that's the proposition, yeah. isn't it? I, I, I think we live in a world where there is uh, a certain ab abandonment of the uh, of a primacy of a jus contrabellum as sort of a you know of a central promise and central project of public international law, um, and where the humanitarian sensitivity, which which was always in tension with the idea of prohibiting war, with a more pacifist sensitivity. Uh, I wouldn't say has taken over, but it has in many ways become more dominant. Okay. Um, and then how does, where do you fit in then the, the crime of aggression discourse? So, of course, um, um, you know, everything is paradoxical. Uh, e even as that is happening, uh, there are energies left, right, to, to be invested in the criminalization of aggression. And, and in a sense, how could one not criminalize aggression in the ICC statute that has all this historical pedigree, etc.? Except that uh, um, it, it does go against the sort of the, the, the common sense of the time and, and things that, that, that I think uh, intellectual movements that are happening in a background. So there's no enthusiasm in 1998 uh, uh, to really incorporate it, so much so that, that uh, the definition of a crime and its proper inclusion is deferred by, uh, by a few years. And eventually at the Kampala conference, and I count that as a success, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I think it's, it's, it's great, uh, a definition is adopted. Nonetheless, you know, before we, we rejoice too quickly, uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of caveats. And, and uh, the first, the most important, according to me, is that, you know, the only states that will subject themselves to jurisdiction uh, when it comes to uh, the crime of aggression are probably states who calculate that they're unlikely to commit it, right? So we, we have that perpetual problem with, uh, with international criminal justice. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, uh, the supporters of the inclusion of aggression are kind of few and far between. And that includes some of our, uh, you know, some of our colleagues in the public international law profession being a little skeptical that aggression should be included and worried that this could politicize the court and worried that it might detract attention from the urgent task of repressing war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity. Um, and in fact, there's even a letter by NGOs in Kampala, leading human rights NGOs, um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, saying they have no stake in this game and you know, they don't really see this as, uh, as important as the humanitarian issue. 
Uh, if you take, this has been, you know, the, the human rights watch. I can make been, a very cynical uh, comment and the viewers shall forgive me. I mean, if we achieve that desired result, they would be out of a job, but that's a little bit cheeky, isn't it? If we achieve a desired <laughs> result of... Uh, not having war, then right. we would not have war crimes and violations of human rights. Well, but fair, that's being fair cheeky. Enough. It is being cheeky, but it's, it's an interesting point, Phil. Uh, you can see how the humanitarian tradition in its kind of political and ideological agnosticism about whether war in itself is ever legal or not uh, really isn't that concerned, uh, uh, and, and they, they are invested in a certain, in the normality of, of, of war. That's, I think, very true. Of course, at a certain level, everyone is against war. So, yeah. so let's move to the prescriptive part of the paper. So the analytical framework is to say that the shift to the concentration on war crimes and crimes against humanity and all manner of use in bello uh, uh, criminal activity has taken away the urgency from actually international humanitarian law to yes. prevent war in and of itself. You don't give much hope or you don't give as much importance to the crime of aggression discourse. So where do you think we should be going? So, you know, I, I in, in my piece, I, 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 I deplore the, the lack of energy and an enthusiasm that's being invested in um, you know, resurrecting and keeping alive a, a strong pacifist uh, uh, sensitivity. And in, in some ways, you know, the, as often, the diagnosis is in itself a sort of prescription, right? It's a call to pay attention to these underlying never resolved uh, issues. And, and, and sometimes the discipline's tendency to, to, to gloss over these ideological, these deep ideological rifts as if they, they were sort of, you know, background issues that could be uh, resolved by, you know, a better definition of aggression or, uh, you know, if only we kind of fine tune the details, will the, uh, the big issues will solve themselves. I'm reminded, uh, I, and I, I think it's, it's worth uh, maybe reminding our, our readers that uh, the very first Nobel Peace Prize was uh, jointly uh, awarded to the, uh, uh, the Red Cross and to Frédéric Passy, who's a leading French pacifist at the time. Uh, and it was quite forgotten. This created quite a polemic, and the polemic was that the, the sort of a pacifist who supported the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize we're really incredulous that it should be given to a humanitarian organization whose uh, profession was to sort of accompany war and, and you know, minimize the harm it, it caused at, uh, at the margin. So I think, you know, on the, on the long run, uh, it is very hard to disentangle, to say the obvious, uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity from the interstate dimension of, of war, right? So uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and the tens of thousands of casualties in Iraq uh, post-invasion uh, don't simply occur in a sort of humanitarian void where we just have a situation that has arisen miraculously and too many people are killed, right? The, 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 the violation of the use ad bellum, the, the, uh, what I still consider to be an illegal uh, uh, invasion, is, uh, you know, by through a kind of cascading effect, the cause of everything. So that Nuremberg idea, right, that there is nothing more disruptive for international relations, but also nothing more dangerous for civilians, for populations, than uh, uh, the attack of other states. So it's worth underlying that, you know, sad as it is, and, uh, but you're right, it's almost inevitable. If there's war, there will be war crimes. Right, right. So and, and often much more. I mean, one of the lessons of, of the Holocaust uh, is the imbrication of, uh, you know, the invasion of, of Eastern Europe, uh, with the, 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 the kind of killing and, and genocidal machinery. The, the two were very uh, uh, closely connected. So I think the, you know, there's a danger that in recharacterizing threats to international peace and security as merely domestic. But then, you know, I must, there was one, I have one, I liked the article very much and I truly recommend it to our readers. But I was left with one thing that maybe in terms of your own project, <coughs> you made a, maybe a tactical or strategic error because in line with that, you would have 
expected that you would really valorize the discourse of the crime of aggression because it's going exactly in the direction that you would like it to go. But in some way, when one finishes reading the article, one says, well, maybe it's not as big a deal as some would have us believe. And it undermines, in some way, the very project right. which you so, are advocating. Well, yes, fair enough. But, but that, I think, ambivalence is, is often you know, the, the, the best one can arrive at. Uh, I also happen to have my ambivalence about uh, the focus on criminalizing aggression uh, before the, the, uh, the International Criminal Court, and then in particular, its, uh, its emphasis on individual criminal responsibility. I think there's a lot to say for the fact that uh, countries attack and invaded, not just because leaders say so, but because uh, democratic checks and balances haven't uh, worked properly, and in some cases, because populations democratically support illegal acts. So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, there's also a certain narrowness and and uh, a kind of you know maybe excessive um, legalism involved but, in the criminalization of aggression. But so you're also advocating somehow reopening the whole debate in the International Law Commission on State Responsibility on Crimes of State, the yes. famous Article 19, and yes. But that never went away. And so what's interesting, of course, is that it was clear for early international criminal lawyers that the state would be the subject of international criminal law. But you know, even though that orientation at, at the ILC and ended up you know, not leading to much, the Inter-American Court has uh, uh, you know, used the concept of crimes of state. Uh, and even if we don't go there, state responsibility, good old state responsibility for acts of, uh, of aggression, uh, you know, might be as opposed to always you know, focusing on the individuals, which is, I think, the current obsession, um, might go a long way to uh, also giving due credit to sort of a collective decision to, to go to war and the fact that, you know, some uh, occasionally, I mean, if you, if you think after the Second World War in terms of reparations uh, or after the First World War, but it's, it's often forgotten that this also arose after the Second World War, Germany paid uh, uh, significant war reparations. People, fo re you know, rewrite history a bit by focusing only on the Nuremberg trial, but there was also that uh, collective uh, uh, dimension. Listen, we're not going to be able to resolve it, but I think we've provoked our readers sufficiently to have them turn to both the symposium and especially your article. Thank you very much, Frederick. Thank you very much, sir.